Hello everyone, and welcome to our online lecture for Psych 1101 and Psych 1010 at Lanier Technical College. My name is Michael Holman, I am a psychology instructor here at Lanier Tech, and I will be your narrator. Please note that these lectures are intended to assist you in better understanding the material, and should not be considered a substitute for attending lecture, reading the text, or completing your assignments. So this time around we're talking about social psychology. We are going to define social psychology, define attitude and discuss factors that shape it. We will define social perception and describe the factors that contribute to it. We will explain why people obey authority figures and conform to social norms and describe how and why people behave differently as group members than as individuals. So true or false? People act in accord with their consciences. That is false. We appreciate things more when we have to work for them. That is true. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. That is true. Opposites attract. That is false. We tend to hold others responsible for their misdeeds, but to see ourselves as victims of circumstances when we misbehave. That is true. Most people will torture an innocent person if they are ordered to do so. That is also true. Seeing is believing. That is false. Nearly 40 people stood by and did nothing while a woman was being stabbed to death. And that is true. So what is social psychology? It is the study of the nature and causes of people's thoughts and behavior in social situations. And it's based around the situationist perspective, which says that social influence goads people into doing things they would not usually do. We're going to start with attitudes. Attitudes can be cognitive evaluations or mental judgments, feelings, and behavioral tendencies. But when studying attitudes, we have something called the AB problem. There are certain factors that affect the link between your attitudes, A, and your behavior, B, or what you actually do. Things like the specific situation or specificity, the strength of the attitude, do you have a vested interest in per performing this way? And accessibility of values. We create attitudes, we form them, through learning. Learned attitudes are created from conditioning or by observation. There is also cognitive appraisal, or that mental judgment, where you form an opinion after appraisal and evaluation of a situation. Now, when talking about attitudes, there are ways to persuade people to change attitudes. And to do this, we use something called the elaboration likelihood model. There are two routes of persuading someone. You can either use the central route of persuasion, where you just provide your evidence, all your talking points and your arguments, and say, here you go. And then you have persuaded them because they have all the facts now. There's also the peripheral route of persuasion. This is when we associate ourselves with positive cues and we associate the person we want them to be persuaded against with negative cues. And we see both of these in American politics all the time. In order to persuade someone, repeated exposure to things and people will enhance their appeal. This is why you will see campaign ads on the radio, on television, in movies, on Facebook, everywhere, over and over and over again, anytime it's election season. Because the more that you see that person's face, the more you recognize them, and therefore, the better you uh, will be when trying to persuade them. So, another interesting fact is that fear has more appeal and is more persuasive than facts. There have been many, many cases where someone voted a certain way or made a certain decision because they were afraid of what would happen if they didn't. If you know anyone that in the most recent election, 
for 2016. Uh, if you know anyone that voted for the candidate that they voted for, not because they liked them or agreed with their position, but because they were afraid of what would happen if the other person won, then you know for a fact that the fear appeal is more persuasive than facts. And the thing was, both candidates knew this too. Both of them said, hey, at least I'm not the other guy. And people voted for them, purely for that reason. So in order to persuade someone, you must be a persuasive communicator. And that means that you show expertise in what you're talking about. You appear trustworthy. In some cases, you're attractive or you have a similarity to the audience. This last one is one of my favorites. The next time there's a national election, just wait until they get to Texas. I guarantee you the candidates will be on stage in a cowboy hat and boots. Why? Because they want to appear similar to the audience, and when they do that, the audience is gonna think, hey, they're just like me. That's what we see quite a bit of. When we are confronted with information that counters our own attitudes, we tend to do one of two things, either selective avoidance or selective exposure. So you either choose to avoid information that you don't agree with, or you choose to only be exposed to information that you do agree with. So you'll get lots of information, but it's only stuff you already agreed with. We call this an echo chamber. Uh, these are really two sides of the same coin. When talking about persuaded audiences, the people most likely to be, uh, to resist being persuaded, sorry, are people with high self-esteem and low social anxiety. They are the most resistant to being persuaded or to social pressure in general. Now there are a number of techniques that we can use to persuade people. There's the foot in the door technique where we take a small request and then get progressively larger ones. We see this all the time. I see it all the time with students, you know. They'll say, oh, I know it's five minutes after the due date, but will you please accept this assignment? And I'm nice, and then I say sure, and I accept it, and now it's a day late, but will you please accept this assignment? And now it's a week late, now it's a month late, and on and on and on, right? Foot in the door technique. The old, if you give them an inch, they'll take a mile. So we see that quite a bit. There's also the low ball technique. So with this one, it's very interesting. Uh, Imagine that you're at a thrift store and you see a couch and you know for a fact that couch is worth $200 but they have it listed at $150. But you don't want to spend $150. You've only got 100 bucks in your pocket. So what do you do? Well, if you want, you might go to the salesperson and say, I know you've got that listed for $150 but I'll give you 50 for it. Well, what you did was you lowballed them because now you've planted the seed in their mind of, well, I want to sell it for 150. They're offering me 50, which I don't want to go that low. What I could try and do is compromise. And so they're going to compromise and maybe sell it to you for 75 bucks or 100 bucks, which is more in line with what you actually wanted to pay. So there's a little bit of manipulation there. You see quite a bit of manipulation in this chapter. So that's another technique of persuasion. Another attitude theory is known as cognitive dissonance theory. This theory explains the discomfort of inconsistencies in attitudes and behaviors, and we know that humans usually reduce dissonance in the easiest way possible. Okay, so what are we talking about? Well, number one, dissonance means discomfort. And of course, cognitive means thinking. So you could translate this as mental discomfort theory. Cognitive dissonance theory says that sometimes we have attitudes that don't match up with our behaviors and that makes us feel bad. That makes us feel uncomfortable and mentally. And so we will try to get rid of that mental discomfort the easiest way possible. When an attitude is inconsistent, an individual is motivated to reduce that inconsistency. Festinger and Carl Smith did a very interesting experiment in 1959 where they found that people paid less, rated the task more interesting, and they had attitude, discrepant behavior, and effort justification. So what the heck am I talking about? Well, you'll see it in these next couple of slides. So what these two scientists did 
was they purposefully designed the most boring task possible. As you can see here, they would take little wooden spindles and then they would tell you to put them in the tray. And then once you were done putting all the tr spindles in the tray, page two said, take all the spindles out of the tray. And then you open to page three and it says, put all the spindles back in the tray. Afterwards, we had one group of people that were just thanked for their time and then they were given a survey where they rated how boring the task really was. But then we had two more groups of people that all took the same boring task. Both of them were told the same story, that normally what happens is the next person that comes in, we uh, have someone explain to them that this is actually a super exciting task from another participant. We usually have an actor that will explain this that it's a super exciting task. This actor will lie to this person. But we're a little embarrassed, but is it possible that you would be willing to be our actor because our main guy called out sick? We'll pay you for it. Virtually all participants agreed to lie to the next person coming in. Half of the, these participants were only paid one dollar. The other half were paid twenty dollars to lie to this person. And then afterwards, after they lied to the person and given their money, they were then taken to the next room and they were asked to rate how boring was this task really. So when we asked them, did you enjoy the task, the one dollar participants actually said yes and the twenty dollar participants said no. We believe that the reason why the $20 participant said no is because they felt that the effort required in order to lie to someone about how boring the task was, was justified because they were given $20. They were like, heck yes, it was boring. That's why they paid me $20 to lie about it. But the people that were only paid a dollar couldn't really write that off. They couldn't say that they felt justified in lying about how boring this task was for just $1. So instead, they changed their attitude. Remember, with this particular theory, in order to get rid of cognitive dissonance, which they felt, that mental discomfort because they were lying, you can either change your attitude about the situation or you can change your behavior. You can't change behavior that has already happened. So they changed their attitude about the task and they said that they actually did enjoy it. This is part of dissonance theory, reducing the mismatch between two attitudes, beliefs, or behaviors. It really explains why someone could be a hypocrite. And there are a number of methods of reducing dissonance. There are indirect strategies, like changing your attitude. There are direct strategies, like changing your behavior. And there's also trivializing an inconsistency, saying, oh, well, this was just the one time. And we see cognitive dissonance all the time. Uh, for example, if you ever know anyone that uh, disagrees with climate change, well, the problem with this is that there are countless scientists, 99% of scientists, that all say that climate change is real, that global warming is happening, all sorts of things. And they have research and data to prove it and back it up, and it keeps getting replicated when we talk about the scientific method. So it's pretty much solid scientific evidence that climate change is happening and someone still says that they don't believe it. That is an example of cognitive dissonance, or they don't trust science in general anymore, right? That is cognitive dissonance. You've decided that rather than change your attitude about this opinion, you're gonna change your opinion about science in general. The next thing we're gonna talk about is prejudice and discrimination. Well, this all starts as a stereotype, with, which is a fixed conventional attitude. Stereotypes can be positive or negative, and we know stereotypes about all sorts of things. There's, uh, you know, all blondes are stupid, white people can't jump, all black people are athletes, all Asians can't drive, all Latinos are illegal immigrants, all Asians are good at math, all black people love fried chicken, all white people are rich. The, Ideas go on and on and on, right? So those are stereotypes. They are mental shortcuts in how we think about an entire group of people. But what happens is that we often will use stereotypes to create prejudices, which are a type of attitude. 
And prejudice has many forms at different levels. So at the mental level, the cognitive level, prejudice will manifest itself as expecting that members of that target group are gonna behave poorly. At the emotional level, how you respond emotionally when you are exposed to this group. And at the behavioral level, when these responses affect your behavior, it changes from just being prejudicial attitudes to discriminatory behavior or discrimination. So here's an example. Let's say that you're waiting for your friend to get off work and you're sitting in an empty parking lot in your car. And while you're sitting there, you see an African-American gentleman walking through the parking lot. And as he's walking through, first, you find yourself paying more attention to him. What is he doing? Why is he doing that? You might be afraid, or thinking rather, that he's going to mess with you or come to your car. That was at the cognitive level, and that was a prejudice. It was the expectation that members of target group will behave poorly. So you expected him to do something that you wouldn't like for no other reason than his race. As he gets closer, it moves to the emotional level. Now you start getting nervous. You start getting fearful. You start thinking, why is he getting so close to me? It's still prejudice, but now it's at an emotional level. You're getting scared simply because a black man is getting closer to you. And then at the behavioral level, when this man walks past your car, you make sure to lock the car doors. In that moment, your prejudice has changed into discrimination because you have changed your behavior purely because of your attitude. There are a number of sources of prejudices. Dissimilarity, these people are different from you. Social conflict, you believe that they are competing for resources. You might have heard of the old expression, they took our jobs, right? Same thing, that's social conflict. Social learning, you observe other people having these prejudicial attitudes, and so you have them too. Information processing, so if something happened to you, or it happened to someone you know, you would then assume that whoever was the perpetrator of that incident, all people of that group are like that perpetrator. And that brings us to social categorization. You believe that all people of this group fall within this category of the enemy or the other or someone to be afraid of or to not trust even. So why does prejudice exist? Well, for one, there's realistic conflict. There is that competition for resources, whether it's jobs or tax money or any number of things. And then there's social categorization of believing that someone is in the in-group versus the out-group. The in-group is any group that you're in. That is your in-group. It is the group you are in. Anyone that is not like you is a part of the out-group. So that is anyone not a part of your group. We tend to like people that are like us, that are in our in-group, and we tend to not trust or are fearful of people that are not like us, that are in the out-group. There's also social learning. Prejudice is transmitted through culture. It is a fact. People are not born racist. They are not born bigots. They learn to be bigots. They learn to be prejudiced from their culture. And we see this every day when you watch television and people of color are uh, displayed as being poor or as being criminals. That sends a message, whether you know it or not. That's why representation can become so important in television and other media platforms. To better demonstrate this, we did a very famous study called the Robber's Cave Study. In the first part of this study, we had participants who were all young boys wear different colored shirts, and so they were part of different camps at a summer camp. And the gray shirts were on one side of a lake, and the yellow shirts were on the other side of the lake. And at first they were working together, learning how to make rope bridges and stuff, and everything was fine. They didn't have any issues with each other. But then we introduced a competition for resources. We made them start p competing for, treasure, for treasures, for uh, ribbons, for trophies, all sorts of stuff. Things that they would really want. Right away, as soon as there was a competition for resources, the boys started coming up with mean names to call each other. They started pranking each other. They started hating on each other. Well, naturally, we had to figure out a way to undo the damage that we had just done. So what we did was we now said, okay, you can still get these prizes, 
but you're gonna have to work together. So for example, if they needed to set up a tent in order to get the prize, we would say that the gray shirts have the instructions or the directions for how to make a tent, but the yellow shirts have all the pieces that you need. And so they had to work together in order to get the prize that they wanted. And when we did that, we found that the pranks and the swearing at each other and the animosity virtually disappeared. And that's how you change prejudice, through something called the contact hypothesis. This is when you increase awareness of similarities. So you realize, oh, we're not so different. You're changing people from being in the out group to being more in the in group. When you find out that your information is inconsistent with stereotypes, so you believe that all people of a certain group behave in a certain way, and then you meet people from that group, and they're not behaving in that way. That then will challenge your view of outgroup homogeneity. And I know that sounds like a really big and scary word, but what it really means is to challenge your view that everyone in this group is the same or acts the same, right? So you meet someone that is different from what you thought people were like of that group, and so you realize, oh, maybe they're not all the same. But what often can happen is that when you realize that people are not all the same, instead of changing your attitude, you will instead commit recategorization. Uh, for example, there's a great video where Oprah talks about how she's raising sheep and she has white sheep and black sheep and she has a farmer neighbor and she's talking to her farmer neighbor who is a white man about uh, her sheep and um, he goes and they were talking about how the sheep uh, sometimes if you have a black sheep it will turn white sometimes it doesn't and she was telling him how all of her black sheep stayed black and he said, yeah, I don't know. I don't understand why all your black sheep stayed black. And she said, yeah, I guess it's because they knew they were in a black family. And the farmer neighbor says, oh, you're not black. You're just a neighbor. And she said, I definitely am black. But what he was really saying and what she understood was that he had now recategorized her. Because she wasn't like what he thought other black people were like, he had recategorized her as not being black. She was something else. But one thing that can help with changing prejudice is also mutual interdependence. Just like in the robber's cave study, if we have to work together for a common goal, it tends to reduce that amount of prejudice there. And we see this a lot in another activity that is often done in classrooms even to this day. It's called the jigsaw classroom. So you know how in schools a lot of times, you know, uh, all the white kids will sit together in their own little group at lunch, and all the black kids will sit together with their own little group. We all get into these little cliques, right? The reason why is because we, we want to be around people like us. We want to be in people that are in the in-group. So when you see someone that's similar to you, you are drawn to sit with them. Well, this is not anything new. This has been happening in schools forever. And so to try and combat this, when you see that people are falling into these cliques, the way that a teacher can stop it is using a technique called the jigsaw classroom. So what she will do is she will have all of her students break out into their own self-chosen groups. And of course, they're going to follow into those regular cliques that they would choose anyways, like if they were at lunch or something. So she then will give them an assignment. And she'll say how each group, for example, will research different aspects of the War of Independence and present your research to the rest of your group at the end. But what happens next is that each group member has been assigned a special topic. So in this case, someone was assigned George Washington. Someone else was assigned Benjamin Franklin. Someone else was assigned Paul Revere. So what happens next is that all the people from each group that were assigned George Washington have to meet up to form new groups. And now together they have to get the information that they need for the report on George Washington because all of them want to do well. And so then they all get the information that they need and they bring it back to their cliques. They bring it back to their chosen groups. 
and they all have the same information, but now they've all worked together. And what happens is the next time that they get to form up into groups, they're less likely to form cliques. Instead, they'll join with these people that they've now worked with. They've said, oh, I've worked with you before, and you did really well. I like that, so I'm going to keep working with you. And so that's one way that we can help to reduce the segregation happening in the classroom. Moving on from prejudice and discrimination, we're now going to talk about interpersonal attraction. There are several factors that contribute to attraction, including physical appearance, gender differences and preferences. We know, for example, that males tend to prefer physical appearances and females tend to prefer professional status. However, within the last couple of decades, we found that this is shifting. Now, females are expecting their partner to be more physically attractive and males are expecting their partners to have a more professional status. We've done surveys of populations and we've asked participants how willing would you be to marry someone who blank? The purple is the male answers and the green is the female answers. And what we found was, for example, more women were willing, by their own opinion, to marry someone that they didn't think was good looking. Uh, more men were willing to marry someone younger than them by five or more years, while women were more willing to marry someone older than them by five or more years. Um, men were more willing to marry someone that had less education than them, and men were more willing to marry someone of a different race, while women were slightly more willing to marry someone of a different religion. So these are just very interesting tidbits about what men and women are willing to do in terms of relationships. When talking about interpersonal attraction, we're talking about loving someone, about liking somebody. So this all comes down to something called the attraction similarity hypothesis, which says that our partners tend to be just like us. We want people that have similar attitudes because nobody wants to argue and disagree all the time, especially not in a relationship. And we are attracted to people who share our attitudes. There are several factors that influence our preferences, and one of them is propinquity, which is simply talking about how much uh, a particular attractive feature might change depending on what is available. For example, if you're attracted to intelligence, you'd probably be attracted to someone that was a professor or something like that, or a scientist even. But if you live in a small town with one stoplight, you might be more inclined to like someone that is just reading the newspaper every day or watches the news all the time. Why? Because that's what's available to you. And so that's what you go for. So you kind of might lower or increase your standards depending on where you are and what your situation is. Now, when we're talking about love, we tend to follow in psychology the triangular model of love, which says that there are three key components, intimacy, passion, and commitment. For example, romantic love combines intimacy and passion, but consummate love combines all three. But before you love somebody, you gotta like them. And liking requires first physical attraction and then repeated contact. These two things can help you to like a person, to become more attracted and eventually become in love with them, possibly. It also helps if you have very similar interests and ideas. When we love someone, we might have different types of love, like companionate love or passionate love. I'll talk about those in a minute. And we also know that there are certain attachment styles. There is secure attachment, avoidant, and anxious ambivalent. This is very similar, if not the same, as what we talked about with uh, attachment styles amongst children and their parents. But now we're talking about relationships. So with someone that has a secure relationship, this means that they can, for example, go to a party and both members of that relationship can just leave and hang out with completely separate people, they don't have to check in the entire time, and they feel happy, they feel comfortable, because they know at the end of the night they're going to leave together. Nothing is going to threaten their relationship. That is a secure attachment relationship. A avoidant attachment relationship is insecure. This is someone that is trying to avoid 
anything that could possibly hurt the relationship. So they say, oh yeah, we have a great relationship. As long as we don't talk about this subject, or this subject, or that subject. That's avoidant. You're avoiding those subjects to keep your relationship happy. There's also anxious ambivalent. So this is a relationship that slides between being angry and also just being indifferent. So this is a relationship where the attachment is very angry. You're, you're upset that this person went out without you and didn't invite you. Oh, I'm just going to be left at home to be alone, I guess. Well, you're out having fun. That's fine. Right. If you've ever heard that kind of conversation, then you know that that is an anxious, ambivalent relationship. And it is not a secure relationship. So this is the famous triangular model of love. It says that there are three key components, intimacy, commitment, and passion. And there are lots of different kinds of loves. So and we're going to talk about each one of them. So let's start with liking someone. Liking someone is just having intimacy. It's basically having a crush. So it's intimacy, which is vulnerability. So this isn't just talking about sex. This is about allowing yourself to be vulnerable with someone. So when you like someone, you're vulnerable to them. Uh, you know this to be true if you've ever had a crush on someone and then you found out that they already have a boyfriend or they already have a girlfriend or they're married or they're just not interested in you, right? And it kind of hurts. It's like, ow, right? That is vulnerability. That is just having intimacy. But there's no commitment there. There's definitely no strong emotions or passion. Speaking of passion, let's talk about infatuation. So when you just have strong emotions for someone, you just have passion for that person, it is infatuation. I like to call this stalker love. Uh, we also see this with a lot of young teenagers, usually teenage girls, that have those obsessions with some current teen heartthrob or celebrity, right? That celebrity has no idea who they are. So there's certainly no commitment between them. And there's definitely no intimacy because the celebrity doesn't even know who they are. But there is a lot of strong emotion, a lot of passion for this person. So it's infatuation. When you only have commitment in a relationship, it's known as empty love. It's not really love. It is commitment for the sake of being commitment, of, of being committed, sorry. So if you've ever known a couple that uh, is married, usually very super Catholic couples, they're married but they refuse to get divorced even though they hate each other, even though they sleep in separate beds and they can't even have a simple, rational conversation together, but they're not going to get divorced because they made a commitment or if they said that they would stay in a relationship for the kids. They don't even love each other, but they don't want to upset their children. That is empty love. It is done for the commitment alone. The next kind of love is romantic love. This combines passion and intimacy. So you're vulnerable, but you also have very strong emotions. Romantic love is what we always think about, what we always imagine when we think of loving someone right you know roses and candles and wine and chocolate and all that sort of valentine's day stuff but notice what's missing from romantic love commitment so someone can love you romantically but not be committed to you this might explain a few things if you've ever had someone that showed they were not committed to you but they still said that they loved you they did love you but they weren't committed to you the next kind of love is companionate love. This combines intimacy once again, but this time with commitment. Now, this is friendship love. This is that love that happens between best friends, right? If you have that best friend that could call you in the middle of the night, three in the morning, crying, super upset, and you are already in your car and headed to take care of them, right? That is companionate love. There is intimacy. There is vulnerability. If you've ever been in a fight with your best friend, it feels like a breakup. And there's also commitment to that person. But there's not necessarily strong emotions like passion. Down at the bottom we have fatuous love. This combines strong emotions like passion with commitment. This is family love, loving people that are blood relatives. But notice that you don't have to like this person. You don't have to have intimacy in order to have fatuous love. I can like my dad. I can love my dad. I can have fatuous love for my parents. It doesn't mean that I like them, right? And we all can probably relate to that with someone at some extent. Finally, in the center, we have consummate love. This is what combines passion, intimacy, and commitment. Consummate love is what we all tend to strive for. 
but not everybody gets it. Usually, most people find themselves somewhere else on this triangle. Okay, the next thing we're going to talk about is social perception. So what is it? Well, social perception examines the ways in which we form and modify our impressions of others. Our first impression usually matters a great deal. We infer traits from behavior, and we do this based off of the primacy or the recency effect. The primacy effect is your first impression. The recency effect is the most recent impression that you have of that person. And this leads us to attribution theory. It is the process by which one draws conclusions about the influences on another's behavior. We often will have either dispositional attributions or situational attributions. Dispositional attributions are internal factors. For example, I did a good job because I'm smart. So this happened because of something you did. Situational attributions are external factors. I did a good job because the task was easy. So now it's because of something outside of yourself. Attribution theory says that there is something called the actor-observer effect. Imagine that you are walking along the sidewalk and you fall down and really hurt your knee and it hurts really bad. If no one is around, you're probably going to go, oh gosh, oh that hurts, oh man that was so bad, right? And, and kind of focus on the pain for a little bit because no one's around. But if you know that people are watching you when you fell and hit your knee, you're probably going to jump right back up and act like it doesn't hurt you at all. That's the actor-observer effect. We change how we behave simply because we think people are watching. And this leads to the fundamental attribution error, where we attribute too much of someone else's behavior on being dispositional, on being something inside of them. We often will see this a lot in individualistic cultures, where we have a bias towards assuming that something is wrong with someone else when they do behavior we don't like. Which leads to the self-serving bias. So this is when we say that if someone else, say, cuts you off in traffic, then there must be something wrong with them. How could they be so reckless driving, right? But if I have to cut somebody off in traffic, well, I'm a victim of circumstance. I'm running late, and I cannot afford to be late anymore at work. That's the self-serving bias, right? It's awful when other people do it and there's something wrong with them, but when it happens to me, it's situational. We also need to talk about a theory known as the belief in a just world. This is when you believe that people get what they deserve. And it doesn't sound so bad at first until you realize that it's talking about everything. So it's saying that if you won the lotto, you deserve it. If you get arrested, you deserve it. If someone attacks you, mugs you or assaults you in even worse ways, you deserve it. You did something to bring this on yourself. If you got cancer, you deserve it in some way. And that sounds terrible, but lots of people tend to have this belief, and we see it quite a bit. Uh, rape victims will often say how when they are addressing the, the events happening in their life and the horrible assault that they had to deal with, uh, that oftentimes the line of questioning from others is, well, what were you wearing? Why were you in that part of town at that time of night? Didn't you know better than to walk alone through that dark alley? So that is representative of the belief in a just world. So keep that in mind so that hopefully you don't fall into that trap yourself. When talking about others, we need to talk about body language. This is communicating to someone through posture and gestures. So you might touch someone to express interest. You might gaze into their eyes or stare at them. All of this is body language. I love to people watch. And I will go to the mall or to a bar or something like that. And I'll watch people, complete strangers, have no idea who they are. And judging based solely on their body language, I can figure out if they're going to have a great night when they talk to someone at the bar or if they're going to be left alone based on the body language of the person that is interested in them or that they think is interested in them. So the next thing we're going to talk about is social influence. Social organizations are categorized as groups. To be a group, you need to have regular interaction, emotional connections, and interdependence. So if you have a class, then that is a group. So groups are just groups of people that regularly get together. 
every group has norms. We often call these social norms. And when you violate a norm, it is enforced through sanctions. For example, if you have a group of friends and one of them breaks up with their long-term boyfriend and you discover later that someone else in your group of friends has started dating that boyfriend, it's probably not gonna go well in that group. You know, people are gonna start talking about this person. They can't believe she would do that. Uh, I always knew that she was a slut. Any number of things, right? That talking about her, maybe not inviting her to functions or putting her in a separate group chat so nobody has to talk to her that way and excluding her, those are sanctions because she violated a norm. It wasn't something that was outright said. Norms are unspoken rules, but you still knew that you shouldn't do it, right? And so when someone violates that norm, you sanction them in a number of different ways. In every group, we also play different roles. This is the expected behavior based on positions within that group. In one group, you are the student. In another group, you might be the teacher. In another group, you might be the person that knows the most about a certain subject. In another, you have no idea what you're doing. You ha might have one group where you are the jester and you make all the jokes. And in the other, you're the super serious friend. So it really just depends, but we all play different roles depending on the group of people that we're in. So what is social influence then? Well, social influence examines the ways people influence thoughts, feelings, and behaviors of others. So how do we manipulate each other, essentially? One way that we've studied this is with the Milgram study. This helped us measure obedience to authority. And what Milgram found was that the majority of participants complied with demands of authority even when that required that they inflict a harmful shock on innocent people. So the Milgram experiment was very famous. What happened was Stanley Milgram invited participants in and told them that they were going to participate in a study on learning using punishment. And they walked into a room with another uh, participant and they had to draw lots to, 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 excuse me, to determine who would be the learner and who would be the teacher. What they didn't know was that the other participant was an actor and it was fixed. The learner was always going to be the actor. And so they go into the next room and the learner is hooked up to a big scary machine and is told that they will be asked a series of questions and if they get any questions wrong, they will experience an electrical shock distributed by the teacher. And then we go into the next room and the teacher is with the big scary machine and it's got voltages going all the way up to a lethal dose of electricity. And so the teacher will simply ask them questions. And every time the learner gets something wrong, they will flick a switch and then they will electrocute that person. What researchers were trying to see was how far is someone willing to go simply because the experimenter told them to keep going. What they didn't know was that the learner was never actually getting electrocuted in the first place. All of their responses were pre-recorded and so they would intentionally get questions wrong and then when they were shocked by a minor voltage, you would hear, oh gosh, oh it hurts, all those sorts of things. And what we wanted to see was, when would the participant put a stop to this experiment? And, any t and many times, participants would say, are you sure that he's okay? It sounds like he's in a lot of pain. And the experimenter would say, would never tell them you have to keep going. They would say, in order for the experiment to continue, you must comply. So they put pressure on them to keep going. They weren't sure how this would go, but they expected that one tenth of one percent of participants would take a electric shock to the lethal dosage when administering it to someone that was the learner. What we found instead, however, was that over 51% of participants were willing to electrocute someone to death simply because a authority figure told them to. That was pretty shocking. You can learn more about that in your text as well. So why did this happen? Why do these people willingly electrocute someone simply because they were told to? Well, socialization is a big role in that idea. 
they were taught to obey authority figures. You're taught to do what the doctor says, to do what your teacher says, to do what the police say. So we're socialized to obey authority figures. They also had a lack of social comparison. Most of these people had never even thought that they would ever be in a situation where they were electrocuting somebody for answering the questions wrong. So they didn't really know what to compare it to. There's also the perception that this authority figure is a legit authority figure. In reality, in the Milgram experiment, the guy in the white lab coat was just an actor. He wasn't even a real scientist. They also used the foot in the door technique. So they started out very small with a very tiny electric shock and moved all the way to lethal dosages. And that made it easier for them to do. Their values were also inaccessible in this moment because they hadn't really thought about what they would do in this situation. And it helped if there was a buffer between the perpetrator and the victim. In fact, we would recreate this study later where instead of a wall where the perpetrator couldn't see the victim, there now was a glass window and the likelihood of electrocuting this person to death became much less simply because they could see this person acting as if they were being electrocuted. The next thing we want to talk about is conformity. This is to conform or when we change our behavior to adhere to social norms. So we do what everybody else is doing. Remember that social norms are widely accepted expectations concerning social behaviors. Conformity was studied using the ASH study. And what Ash found was that most people will conform even when they are wrong. So what Ash would do is participants would walk into a room and it would be a room full of people. And Ash would tell them, oh, you're late. Please sit at the end. And he would show them slides like this, where they had to compare this line to this line. And he would go down the row of people and he would ask this person, what do you think is the correct line that's most similar to this line? Then he'd ask this person and then this person, and then the participant. But what the participant didn't know was that everyone else was a paid actor. And so for the first few slides, everything was fine. The actors were saying the correct line. They were saying the obviously uh, correct line to use in the slide. However, eventually they would get to this slide. And he would ask them again, which of the comparison lines is most similar to the standard line. And all of the actors would know to say one. So actor one would say one, actor two would say one, and actor three would say one. And this was the real moment of the experiment that we were looking for. We wanted to see would the participant conform and do what everybody else was saying. Say the obviously incorrect answer simply because everyone else was doing it. And once again, we found that people conform, that they do what everyone else is doing simply because everyone else is doing it. There are a lot of factors that contribute to why you might conform. If you come from a collectivist culture, like those countries in the East, like Japan or Korea, then you're more likely to do this. If you have a desire to be liked by the people in the group, you're more likely to do what the group wants. If you have low self-esteem and high social shyness, you're more likely to conform to group pressure. If you're not familiar with the task, you think, well, I was late, maybe they know something I don't know, then you're more likely to conform to what they do. Group size also plays a big role. Maybe you're thinking to yourself right now, you know, if three other people said the wrong answer, I'd still say the right answer. I wouldn't conform, and maybe that's true. But what if you were an entire football stadium full of actors and they all said that it was the obviously wrong answer and then it's your turn what are you going to say might be a little bit harder to fight that peer pressure then and also social support one fascinating version of the ash study occurred where he actually had one per one of his actors say the correct answer so the obviously correct answer while everyone else said the wrong answer when he said the correct answer as an actor the participants almost universally would also say the correct answer because they felt like they had some sort of support from this person. The next experiment tells us about the impact of roles and authority and conformity. It kind of combines all of it and it's the famous Stanford prison experiment. So what happened in this experiment was that participants were paid to be in a study and they were randomly assigned to either be an inmate or a prison guard. 
prison guards were given about two weeks of training where they were encouraged to be uh, creative, but they couldn't physically harm their inmates. But they needed to be creative to try and come up with ways to make their participants fall in line. The inmates knew that they were listed as inmates and were picked up by campus police and then they were taken for quote unquote processing where they were taken to the basement of the Stanford University Psychology Building and put in gowns and uh, given a little number and they were told that you are no longer uh, whatever your name is, you are prisoner 41872 or something like that. So it was supposed to be a study that lasted two weeks. All of them knew that this was a psychological study, just an experiment. And all of them were being paid for this. And it was supposed to last two weeks. They had to shut it down after six days because of so many people having mental breakdowns. What ended up happening is that the guards became terrible and cruel and sadistic, even though they were otherwise normal people when they weren't in this role of prison guard. They would do things like put nettles and needles in their beds if somebody was acting up, or they might take away their mattresses and make them sleep on the hard concrete floor, or they might make them do embarrassing things or do several push-ups or force them to stay in a closet, and they called that solitary confinement, and they were trapped in a broom closet for hours. Meanwhile, the inmates became obsessed with becoming a good inmate. They really did lose their identity. They got lost in being prisoner 84172, or whatever it might be. So, again, so many inmates had awful breakdowns that they had to drop it by six days when it was supposed to go for two weeks. So it's a very fascinating look into how our uh, willingness to obey authority and to perform as certain roles can affect us. So now for the last bit of this lecture, we're gonna talk about group behavior. This is part of something called social facilitation. The presence of others facilitates performance. Sometimes it increases our arousal or our motivation and it makes us perform better because people are watching. But other times you're so apprehensive that people are gonna judge you that you don't perform well at all. The presence of others can impair your performance. You might do something called social loafing. If you've ever been in a group project and one person in that group just doesn't do anything, then you know what social loafing is. It causes a diffusion of responsibility. You say, well, all these other people are here, so if we fail, it's not just my fault. It's everyone else's fault, too. Group decision-making can be a little scary, but there are a lot of different decision schemes that help us to make decisions as a group. The majority wins, you've probably heard of. The truth wins, so we go with whatever the truth is. The two-thirds majority, or the first shift rule. You experience this if you've ever worked first shift, where if you're not first shift, you just do whatever the person in the first shift did. So if someone that came in at eight o'clock was doing this to solve this problem, that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna follow their lead, essentially. What often happens with groups is that we take an extreme position, or we call it polarization. We see this a lot, especially in modern times with modern politics. It's not enough that you can just be a little conservative or a little liberal. Now, everyone needs to be incredibly conservative or incredibly liberal, or they won't get voted into office. To choose to be more in the center about things, to be uh, more, uh, well, both conservative and liberal on certain issues, is considered a risky shift. So this means that you are taking a risk by going against the extreme position in this group. This also can cause a diffusion of responsibility. We see this with the political parties all the time where they say, it's not my fault, I stuck with the group plan. It's not my fault that the group plan was bad, I just did what everyone else was doing. This leads to groupthink which is very dangerous. It is unrealistic group decision-making in which external realities are ignored and is influenced by cohesiveness of the group, so everyone gets along, having a dynamic group leader, and an external threat of some kind. 
So we often will see this in cults where they will view the government as the external threat. You'll have a very charismatic cult leader and all the cult members get along with each other. And so they make decisions as a group and it can be very dangerous. Jonestown was a massacre in the 70s and early 80s in which nearly 1,000 people committed suicide by drinking poison Kool-Aid. If you take a look, uh, if you look up more information about Jonestown, you'll learn more about this. But they were a cult, and they willingly drank poison Kool-Aid, most of them, simply because that's what the group was doing. So groupthink can be incredibly dangerous. There are a number of contri cont contributors to group thinking. Things like feeling invulnerable because you're a part of this group. Believing that the group is doing the right thing discrediting any information that goes contrary to the group's decision. There's also a lot of social pressure to conform within this group and stereotyping members of the out group. Everybody that's not a part of our group is bad, therefore we don't like them. This also leads to mob behavior. Highly emotional crowds may induce mob behavior and we see this uh, with political rallies, at protest rallies, we see this at sports games, where people will come out of a hockey game and flip cars over and set them on fire. And the question is why? Why are people doing this? Why did you get so excited that you started doing all of this dangerous and violent stuff and you know, breaking into buildings and things like that, looting stuff? Well, it's part of something called de-individuation, where you have reduced self-awareness and lower concern of social evaluation. Because everyone in the group is doing it, you lose yourself and you are no longer an individual, you are a part of this group. The last thing I want to talk about is altruism and the bystander effect. There are certain factors that influence your decision to help people. Things like your good mood, uh, being empathetic to others or understanding what emotions they're going through, believing that an emergency exists, and assuming a responsibility to act. Knowing what to do, knowing the person that needs help, and feeling that you're similar to the person who needs help. All of these factors can influence your decision to be a helper, to be altruistic, to help someone in need. But they also can influence whether you choose not to help. There is a sad story about a woman named Kitty Genovese. One night she was walking home from work. It was in New York City in a very populated area. Most people were in bed, it was very late at night, and many others were awake, but they were at home, and their windows were open because it was a hot summer night, and as Kitty was coming home to her neighborhood, a man, a well, for all intents and purposes, a lunatic, approached her and started stabbing her in the middle of the street, and she screams bloody murder, and she's begging people to help her, help me, I'm being stabbed, I'm being attacked and nobody did anything. There were at least 20 to 30 people all around her that later said that they did hear her screams, but none of them did anything. At one point, someone did hear her screaming enough to poke his head out the window and say, hey, what's going on down there? And the attacker ran away. So Kitty ran away too, still screaming, and she ran into a cubby hole. But still, no one came out to see if she was okay to see what was happening. And she's still screaming for help, and guess who comes back? The attacker, and he comes back with the knife, and that is where he continued stabbing her several more times, eventually killing her. This shot the city of New York. They were so horrified that 20 to 30 people stood by and did nothing. But it later became theorized in different research methods that Perhaps Kitty would have survived if less people had been around. What had happened was that all of those people assumed that someone else was going to do something. Everyone assumed someone else was going to call the police. Everyone else assumed that somebody was going to yell or that they were going to go down there and see what was going on. But no one called the police in that entire incident. That is the bystander effect. The bystander effect is when you assume that other people are going to do it and so you do nothing. So it's a very dangerous trap and it is very important to try and monitor it within yourself 
to hopefully not fall victim, victim to it as well. So that's it for social psychology. As always, please make sure you are completing your homework entirely and submitting it by the due date. I will see you next time for the next lecture.